Welcome in to another episode of Your Drone Questions Answered, brought to you by Drone Launch Academy. I'm your host, Chris Breedlove. Today's question is this, what are the different RTK correction methods applicable to drone mapping missions? And what's the best time to use each one? So to help me answer that question, I'm excited to welcome our guest today, Igor Verinov from MLID. Igor, thank you so much for joining the show. Glad to be here, Chris. Awesome, awesome. So would you tell folks your background and in, in, in MLID and kind of how that, that journey got going and how you got here? Today. So I'm Igor Verinov. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Hamlet. I uh, started the company more than 10 years ago, actually at the peak of drone hype when everybody was just, you know, talking drones, drones. At that time, we started the company out of frustration with the high accuracy part of drone mapping. So with placing ground control using base station, everything was really complex, uh, required training and, you know, used to cost like 20 grand for one unit. It was just some kind of industrial equipment and we couldn't figure out why, like drones were developing so quickly, everything was getting more, you know, easier to use every day, but that equipment kind of stayed stagnant and we really wanted to change that. So with that, we started Amlet. We crowdfunded all the way from the beginning. So our first product was just like a small module, just a PCB and that raised around $80,000 on a crowdfunding campaign and kind of we uh, grew the company from there. Today we're shipping tens of thousands of these receivers. I think are the de facto standard for high precision gear for drones specifically, but also for survey construction and other areas. And we're over hundred people. We have offices in multiple countries, our HQ is in Budapest, and we now have another office in Lisbon. That's kind of the, the backstory of family. So we were really driven by this pain of using RTK with drones. And I'm really happy to be here today to answer any questions you might have. If stop using drones with RTK. Absolutely. No, no, that's awesome, Igor. And maybe even we should define RTK, right? Real-time kinematic versus post-process kinematic. But curious what you would kind of say to that, just to kind of give that, that level setting. Well, in general, RTK and TPK are both methods for improving the accuracy of GNSS measurements. So GPS on your phone, for example, on your iPhone has an accuracy of about a couple meters. And there are multiple sources of error that won't allow it to kind of get to those, you know, two centimeters. And you need specialized receivers and software to be able to remove those errors. And we do that by having two receivers close to, relatively close to each other. So maybe within, you know, 20 miles or so. And then assuming that the kind of these, er the errors they're experiencing are going to be the same and then canceling them out. So this technique in general is called RTK, using several receivers, usually to, to cancel out their errors just by saying that, okay, probably their errors are the same because they're close. If we do this in real time, then that's called RTK. And if we do that by recording data and then processing that using special software, that's called PPK or post-process kinematic. So I think that's kind of the, the main idea. We usually refer to when we talk about these two receivers, one connect, correcting the other, we usually refer to the stationary one sending the correction as the base station and the one that is moving to a rover. So for example, your drone could be a rover or just another RTP receiver could be a rover and base stations could be basically your your own receiver, or that could be like governmental installed infrastructure. And we typically call those cores. That's kind of the, the main difference between RTK and PPK and base and rover. And like, to your point, I love how you said that I think folks get confused sometimes, like that a base is somehow like a special widget, but really everything is a rover. And then when it sits still and is broadcasting, now it's become a base, but you could pick it up and move it. And now it's a rover again. And all of your point too, well, the drones are rover. Our drone is always a rover when it comes to mapping. Now, what are those different methods of which I'm going to be getting those corrections, those RTK corrections to my drone? I think there are two main ways how you could be getting those corrections and it really depends on the kind of accessibility of cellular connectivity in the field. So if you have network or not. So typically your controller would connect to like an entry service, so kind of course or some kind of base station that is available over the internet. And that's, I think, the main use case that, for example, DJI designs to their product. And the more challenging situation is when you are outside of coverage. And I think that happens to all of us sometimes. And what do you do then? And for this, we provide a solution in our devices so they can basically serve as a, your own local entry provider. So kind of your super private course, they create this kind of server that is able to present itself as a course network to the DJI controller. Basically, so you connect to the Wi-Fi of a GPS unit and that just tells the uh, DJI controller, okay, look, you can grab the RTK corrections. I am the server. And then the controller sends that to the drone. So the main difference here is like, are you actually connecting to some infrastructure over the internet or you're just connecting to a local base station 
on site, the, the Jack controller still thinks it's connected to some kind of infrastructure, but actually it's just your base station. Um, I think these are two main ways, and then we can uh, we can always do PPK, which is actually the the backup method normally these days. And I would just say that is kind of a word to the wise, especially maybe beginner pilots listening to this. Like, yeah, maybe don't lock yourself out of that PPK, even if it is more of a backup. You know, maybe you are doing RTK first. Make sure your equipment can support you in that in case something else falls away or you need to go to that sort of backup part of the workflow. And everyone really likes uh, RTK, you know, until it fails. So, and I, I mean, at some point you're going to have connectivity issues and you don't want to, uh, to refly that site. So having PPK as a backup option is really something that I think start doing at certain point in your career that you just realize, okay, I better have this backup. But what are the different options there for a pilot short of, or of course, including maybe someone else has already established a known point. They found an existing monument, but just highlight those, those couple options there really quick as well, if you would. So there are actually multiple roles that the receiver and I mean, RS3 specifically could play in the field. So, uh, first of all, you have one receiver that could be a base and the rover at the same time. I know this gets really confusing because usually we think it's two different receivers, but if we are, um, placing a local base in the field, we really want to coordinate that reference to a course. And that means that we want our base station to become a rover in the beginning relative to the course position itself on site and yeah. then operate as a base station to our drone. So we have like two legs of, of corrections here, one from yeah. your local base unit to the drone and one from the course to the, to the local base. And I think that's what we do kind of really well that we blend together these modes and that's absolutely seamless. So you just connect to your course and then once the receiver establishes a, a position, starts outputting corrections to your drone. So it's at the same time, it's a rover for the course. It's a base, real-time base to the drone. It's also recording uh, a raw data log. So it's recording everything that it's observing into a file format called Rhinex. It's uh, industry standard interoperable standard, which allows you then to post-process the observations on your drone, but also the observations of this particular unit relative to the course if need be. So for example, do like opus processing, which is a free and amazing way to, to coordinate your base. And at the same time, another role is it can act as a base station for another unit that's used to shoot ground control points. So it's doing all of these things at the same time in a redundant way. So you have everything in real time, data flowing from course to your local base, from your local base to your RTK drone, from your <laughs> local base to your rover, local rover unit, which you used to shoot ground control points. And it's also recording data for backups. And that's kind of what makes it so powerful. And then I think that the part with ground control is kind of something that's often getting forgotten in conversations about drones and RTK. And I mean, ground control points are absolutely essential, not just to achieve maximum accuracy. We can probably do that with the onboard receivers already, but to have a way to verify your work. Uh, and that's absolutely crucial because, I mean, errors happen and they happen to everybody, especially if we're making lots of flights, lots of sites. So you really need those check shots to verify that your work is good. I mean, that's, that's absolutely essential. That's where your local base really, really shines because with RTK or PPK, the accuracy is really dependent on the baseline. So the baseline is the distance between your base and your rover. So for example, if you're using a course network and that's, I don't know, 20 miles away, that really reduces your accuracy in comparison to using a local base. If you're using a local base, both your drone and your rover that used to shoot ground control point are going to have the smallest possible errors. And also just everything is going to sit really tight relative to each other, both your drone, your pictures on the drone and geotext there, but also the, uh, the checkpoints. Absolutely. That's great. I think the one thing I would just add to that would be obviously if we're like in the absolute middle of nowhere and the nearest core station or whatever in-trip provider through, through the internet is just really far away. That baseline is really long, like worst case scenario, get out there, set up your receiver, log static, go get a known coordinate. And depending on honestly, the software that you're using, right? Cause for example, DVI Terra, let's say for L2 LiDAR processing, I can just throw up my base, start it, use essentially the raw here position. And when I go into the software, because I was also one of those multitasking tasks, right? With logging static, I'll upload the right next to Opus. I'll get a better coordinate. I'll just supersede it then in the software. So I almost at that point sort of did both things. It was an RTK workflow. I was sending corrections there that helped me with terrain follow things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And I just improved even more obviously by post-processing, but I suppose 
there are certainly image workflows, you know, where you can't do that. And in that case, I suppose just to state it for people listening, you might have to show up first, first thing in the morning, or maybe even the day before, whatever you're actually going to fly, go ahead and log static, get that good coordinate from Opus. And now when you're ready to actually fly, whether it's two hours later, the next morning, whatever, you've got that known point already established, you key that in, and now you're doing local RTK base, even though you never maybe had any kind of close enough, you know, short enough baseline, you know, in the moment. So that would be like the ultimate middle of absolute yeah. nowhere, but it's getting rarer and rarer, I think on our earth that you're that far from any kind of network, you know. Yeah, that's, that's true. And I mean, if we're talking about the middle of nowhere use case, then surprisingly using PPK might be more efficient than using RTK just because if you don't have any established known point and you want to use RTK on the drone and you want that to tie into a state plane later on, then what you have to do, you have to do exactly as you said, you have to log data, you have to wait for Opus to process that. And only after that, can you make your RTK flight. But if you do everything in PPK, you just install your base, let it log, fly at the same time, log on the drone. And then, I mean, you can already leave the site and process everything back in the office once Opus is ready to do that. So that saves so much time, just having this versatility. And just being able to make the decision on the spot, okay, what I'm going to do today, I'm going to do this real time, or I mean, if that's not possible, I'm just going to do that in post-processing and you have all those options in your hand and then it's ultimately your decision. So yeah, no, that's a great way to put it. I think we all do this. I do this in all aspects of life. You kind of lock in on like, here's the way I'm going to do this. And that's great like, until it does it or until there's no connectivity. So I love that. How many Igor, be versatile. Know that the tools, especially on the rover side and you know, the receiver side, they can often, even if you do it 90% of the time, one way, you can often pivot in a moment, no harm, no foul, call to waste a bunch of time. I know you guys have that new partnership with Wingtra and, you know, Wingtra ground powered by Emlid, which I feel like, I mean, it is a PPK workflow, but in a way that's pretty neat and kind of slick and guided. Would you like to touch on that a little bit? It's a really nice package, little twist on it. If you'd love to describe that for our listeners. Yeah. So I think ma the main goal of our partnership with Wingtra was to create this kind of RTK kit within the Wingtra ecosystem that kind of really creates an automated workflow and handles all the data, uh, data processing and data management inside the Wingtra ecosystem. I think these days I heard somebody really wise say that surveyors these days are data managers more and more. I mean, there is just so many tools they can utilize and you need to make sure you can somehow manage your data and that becomes more and more difficult to just keep track of everything. And I mean, Winter automates the whole thing. So you don't need to think about your log files or base setups, uh, you know, pole heights. It's all completely automated and presented to the end user as a kind of just as a really neat UI step-by-step. -step which really kind of removes the barrier for, for adoption of the system, um, any barriers in training. So we were really excited to do that because like, if we go back to the origins of Amlet, we we're really frustrated with the whole workflow. And now we get to do it with Wingthrow where everything is completely automated. And that's really exciting just to, to do something like this. Going back to the previous question uh, of RTK and PPK with Wingthrow, we're doing everything in PPK just because that's kind of the the most robust way. And because they're managing everything automatically, all the data in the background, and you don't really need to collect all those files and, you know, and figure out how to process them correctly, which file corresponds to which observation that all happens in the background, it really becomes the easier way to do it in PPK. Yeah. Which even goes back to, I think my comment while you know, some many platforms, Wink is certainly among them are actually PPK first and not even PPK only. And that's perfectly fine. I think we kind of both said it, you know, RTK sometimes when we think of our drone as the river, people get maybe, I don't say hung up, but like, oh, why does it not do RTK or isn't that better? Well, no, like it, it can be, it's great when it works and it really is. We're not saying it's not, but I mean, PPK only is, is great too. And in fact, more common, I would say, again, if you get away from DJI airframes, that's uh -huh. all you do and that's yeah, okay. And like said, the tools will, will help you. The tools will adapt whatever the situation may be. For sure. And I think the main motivation for, for DJI to do that in RTK is that they also want to have RTK functionality in their drone to execute those really accurate trajectories flights. And I think that was the, their main motivation to bring this RTK workflow into the survey world as well. So they just want to enable more accurate flying and that's not really necessary for most missions. So that's why, you know, we trace absolutely fine doing this in PPK. So that's actually the main advantage is you get better accuracy in flight. So, I mean, if that's your requirement, then yeah, you need an RTK drone. Otherwise, PPK is just more robust. In general, it's more accurate. It's just a bulletproof thing. No, no, it's well said. I mean, you know, 
no one's going to take a, a fixed wing like a wing tra and try to get up close to a building facade for an inspection. That's not what the tool is meant yeah. for. We're flying at 250 or 400 feet. We can handle these little undulations. It's not going to, like you said, it always handled in post, right? It doesn't matter. But if I was inspecting my hotel right now, get within 10 feet of the facade, you best believe I want some RTK corrections that I can believe in. Sure. But I don't have an incident. So no, that's really well spread. Well, Igor, thank you so much for coming on today to help us answer this question. Really appreciate your time. And for our folks listening, thanks for listening. As always, if you've got a question you'd like to, us to tackle on the show in the future, please uh, drop in the Drone Launch Connect community, visit ydqa.io, or drop me an email at chris at drone launch academy.com. Until next time, have a great week.